This video we're going to talk about hyperkalemia and some of the ECG changes we see. And in particular, we're going to use this time to focus on peak T waves. So specifically, we're going to be looking at how does hyperkalemia actually lead to the characteristic peak T waves that we might see on the ECG when someone who's experiencing hyperkalemia. So a couple of things to note right off the bat is one, what we're seeing here is a peak T wave. So one of the rules of thumb is if we have a T wave that's greater than half of the size of the QRS complex, that is typically indicative of a peak T wave. So we do see a peak T wave here. In order to understand how hyperkalemia causes peak T waves, we should first review what the myocardial action potential looks like. So I've drawn in the myocardial action potential here, and we're going to be really focused on phase three for this discussion. As a reminder, we have a number of phases of our myocardial action potential here. We have phase zero, which is primarily characterized by sodium influx. We have phase one, which is where we see sodium channels closing, or we kind of reached our depolarization. We start to have potassium channels opening and calcium channels opening, which we see here in phase two, which is our plateau phase. And what we're concerned about here is going to be phase three. And phase three, what we're seeing here is primarily driven by potassium efflux. So again, important to remember that uh, phase three is primarily driven by potassium efflux. And that efflux is being promoted by our potassium rectifier channels. And these in particular are voltage gated channels. So they are going to be responsive to changes in voltage or they're gonna be open by changes in voltage. So these are voltage gated channels. So those are a few important things to recognize when we're looking at, well, how exactly is our T wave impacted by hyperkalemia? And the simple thing is, is that in hyperkalemia, this phase three becomes steeper. So instead of kind of looking more gradual like this, we have a steeper, faster phase three. And what that does, is it creates a steeper or faster T wave, or we start to see a peak T wave because the speed or slope at which uh, phase three occurs is happening faster. So what we have talked about is, well, how does hyperkalemia cause that? So we'll start off with the basics. When we are seeing hyperkalemia or when someone is experiencing hyperkalemia, the concentration of potassium outside the cell increases, or we start to see an increase in serum concentrations of potassium. And we actually get to a point where we actually will start to see more potassium outside the cell than inside the cell. So what we'll do here is we will draw normal versus hyperkalemia. So we'll kind of draw a line through our cell here and we'll say that this is the normal cell and this is our hyper K cell. So in the normal cell, we know a couple of things exist here. One, like we mentioned, what we're seeing in that normal cell is the concentration of potassium is greater inside the cell than outside the cell. So potassium should be our major intracellular ions. All of this green here is potassium, and we should see higher concentrations inside versus outside. So it's not that there's no potassium outside the cell, it's just that, that we have higher concentrations inside versus outside. So when we're looking at hyperkalemia, what's happening is we have our traditional amount of potassium inside the cell, but we have a far greater concentration or far greater serum concentration of potassium outside the cell to the point where we can actually see the amount of potassium outside the cell exceed that inside. And that is typically what we're seeing when we're seeing hyperkalemia is the serum concentration has risen to a point where we have higher concentrations of potassium outside than inside. Now, Again, what is relevant here are a couple channels that we're gonna talk about. So we've already talked about phase three being driven by our rectifier channels. So these are uh, purple ones here are gonna be our rectifier potassium channels. And we also have essentially a potassium leak channel. So these green ones will be our leaky potassium channels. And those are the ones that are open all the time. And this is the reason, or these open channels are the reason why potassium is what primarily drives our resting membrane potential. So potassium can move freely based on its electrical and chemical gradient inside and inside the cell and outside the cell, which is going to help make up our normal resting membrane potential, which is typically around negative 90 millivolts. So again, important to recognize that that normal resting membrane potential is driven by the ability of potassium to move inside and outside the cell based on its normal gradients or based on its electrical and chemical gradients, which will establish our resting membrane potential. And when we look at our normal situation, so when I have more potassium inside versus outside, and I traditionally will have a more negatively charged inside of the cell versus outside the cell. So we also have to remember that we have kind of these big negative proteins that live inside the cell. So the cell is typically more negative inside versus outside. What we'll see in this condition is a situation where potassium concentration inside is greater than outside, 
which will often favor a net efflux of potassium. Uh, and that's kind of how we get to that negative 90. So where potassium meets equilibrium or the equilibrium potential of potassium is usually what's helping to drive our resting membrane potential. Um, so that is what we'll see here. And where this becomes relevant is in hyperkalemia because we have an increased amount of potassium outside of the cell compared to inside of it, it changes the chemical gradient that we see. So a couple things are going to happen is one, that the equilib equilibrium potential is going to change because we change po uh, potassium concentrations and we see a couple things. One is if we have more potassium outside than inside, we are not going to favor potassium efflux in this state. And that's one of the reasons why our, our resting membrane potential will get more positive. So we actually, again, in hyperkalemia, one of the things that we see is that we favor potassium staying inside the cell. So we do not see as much potassium leaving. So again, one of the important pieces here is we favor retention of potassium inside the cell. And one of the, uh, the other things that we'll actually see is if concentrations are high enough, not only are we favoring retention of potassium inside the cell, we actually will promote some influx of potassium as a result of this high concentration, uh, concentration gradient outside of the cell. So we will favor retention of our potassium inside the cell. So the potassium that lives inside the cell doesn't want to leave. And the other thing that we see is actually uh, we can change that gradient and we can see some influx of extracellular potassium. And this will have one big consequence, and that is that we see an increase in our resting mem memory potential. Or those two things are going to make an equilibrium potential or potassium will reach its equilibrium at a more positive value. So what we see is a more positive resting membrane potential. And that is the relevant piece here. And that's the relevant piece entirely for hyperkalemia is that we have a more positive resting membrane potential. So you have to remember that based on two things. One is that in normal conditions, because potassium concentration is lower outside, we favor potassium efflux. We have a chemical gradient that favors potassium efflux. And as a result, that's one of the reasons why we get this negative 90 millivolts as our resting membrane potential. We have more negative inside versus outside. So we're going to see negative 90. When we look at hyperkalemia, one of the things that we see is we actually favor retention of our potassium inside the cell, as well as promote influx of extracellular potassium to inside the cell, which will make the inside of the cell more positive. And you have to remember that we also have way more potassium outside the cell, which creates a more positive extracellular environment. So we create a more positive resting membrane potential. So those things together are going to make a more positive resting membrane potential. So we'll say perhaps the RMP goes up to something like negative 70, so negative 60 or say negative 70 millivolts in hyperkalemia. So it's a more positive. So although it's still a negative number, it's important to remember that is a more positive resting membrane potential. So we still haven't even got into the fact, well, what does this have to do with peak T waves and phase three? And what happens here, what the impact is, is once we have depolarization, so depolarization happens as it normally will. So we know when we have depolarization, sodium channels open. So remember in this phase, what's happening is sodium is entering the cell. So we have sodium influx here. So remember after depolarization, sodium has entered the cell. We get into our plateau phase where we'll start to see a little bit of potassium channel opening, which is being balanced by calcium channels. So we have our plateau phase and where we are gonna see an impact is in phase three. So where we will see the biggest impact of this change is right here in phase three. And the reason for that is that an increase in resting membrane potential changes the way in which our rectifier potassium channels respond. So when we increase our resting memory potential or we make it more positive, these rectifier potassium channels are going to respond a little bit differently. So that is the key here. Why we see a peak T wave is because when we have hyper K, we see a change in actually the kinetics of the rectifier channel. So a couple things happen here to this channel. One is that when we have a more positive resting membrane potential, we make these rectifier cha channels more sensitive or more prone to open. So as the resting membrane potential goes up, these channels are consistently more prone to opening. So if this is say our resting memory potential and we bring it up to say here, what you have to remember is that these are voltage gated channels and they will more likely open at a higher resting memory potential. So at rest, those rectifier channels are more prone or more, have more potential for opening than they typically would when our resting membrane potential is down here or is more negative. So again, one of the things that we're seeing in hyperkalemia, we can draw that in in blue here, is that we see an increase in our resting memory potential. So the cell, if again, remember that all of this is the cell, the cell is sitting at a more positive resting membrane potential 
which means that we're always closer. So we can look at what this line looks like between resting memory potential and our rectifier channels. We are always closer to the electrical gradient in which those rectifier channels are gonna to wanna to open at. So one of the things that's important here is that we are closer or an increase in resting memory and potential puts us closer to opening rectifier channels. So what we can think about is those channels are almost more irritable. So we'll draw that in in blue here is these channels are more prone to opening. So they want to open more readily. So it changes the kinetics of the rectifier channels by increasing the chance of them opening. So increasing their preference for opening. The other thing that we find is that a more positive resting membrane potential, these rectifier channels will stay open longer. So when we're at a more positive resting memory potential, we actually see the rectifier channels will stay open longer. And then finally, because of the increase in resting memory potential and because we're closer to the threshold of, of opening for those rectifier channels, is that more channels have a probability of opening. So basically, the closer to their threshold that we get, the more likely that those channels will open. So again, you have to picture many, many, many of these channels living on the cell membrane. And the more irritable or the more close to resting memory potential we get, or the more we increase that resting memory potential towards the threshold for those potassium channels, more of them are just going to be on that edge ready to open. So when we increase the potential for more opening, we actually increase the probability of more of those channels being available when we make it to stage three. And that's exactly what we see is increased number of rectifier channels open during stage three. So if we think about the impact that that has is we just have more doors through which potassium wants to flow. And what's important to recognize is that once we have a action potential or once we've had depolarization, there will be a huge electrical gradient between the inside and the outside of the cell. So once we have depolarization, and we'll use red here to, to signify depolarization. So once we have depolarization, what we find is that all of that sodium rushed into the cell and now we've got this huge positive change. So the inside of the cell is way, way, way more positive compared to the outside of the cell and that change, so that big change in electrical gradient will always promote potassium efflux. So we will want to see potassium leaving the cell regardless of the fact that we have more potassium out here. We now have this massive electrical gradient that is forcing potassium out and what makes it so fast in hyperkalemia is that we have channels that are ready to open and are open. Actually a whole bunch more of them are open during stage three and they stay open for longer. So we start opening those potassium channels. The length in which they stay open is longer. Uh, we have more of them that are ready. So by the time we get to that stage three, we actually see a massive efflux of potassium. So after depolarization, we really promote that potassium efflux from the cell. And it's that fast, fast, fast movement of potassium, which is actually causing the peak T wave. So what we see here is that... So what we see here is that potassium can now, because it has more channels to go through, these channels have stayed open all the way to phase three here, and they're ready to accept potassium out of them, is a really fast phase three. And it's the speed at which we have that phase three that leads to this peaking of the T wave. So again, to recap, what's happening here? In hyperkalemia, we see an increase in our resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential becomes more positive as our potassium level goes up. That increase in positivity, when we're talking about peak T waves and why it's relevant, is it puts those potassium rectifier channels that are going to start opening as we have a higher or more positive resting memory potential, puts them closer to their threshold, and it increases their preference for opening. So they will start opening more readily. Not only that, that increase in positivity allows them to stay open for longer. So by the time we get to phase three, we've got a whole bunch of them that are open and ready to accept potassium. And because we put almost all of them close to their threshold, they're all ready to accept potassium, or we have more ready to accept potassium in phase three, which leads to faster efflux of potassium. And the faster through which our ions move during one of those stages, the more narrow and more peaked our complex is going to look. And that is exactly what we see on our T wave when we're looking at that early stage of hyperkalemia.